Hello, I'm Atuba George and I'm so blessed to be bringing God's truth to you today. Praise God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're, we're in the beginning days of the month of April and I hope you have started bearing fruit. The Lord gave us a command from this month. He says, go and be fruitful. Bear fruit and your fruit will show, should show the love of God in your life now god is going to be manifesting these things in your life so you allow him praise god and and even today your first deliberate action to show you allow god is demanding for your daily bread are you ready for this join me right now and say father i demand for your gifts of my daily bread you love me so much and you provided on a daily basis bread for me. So Lord, I demand for today's portion in Jesus' mighty name. I receive it right now. Amen. Praise God. A miracle is surely going to happen in your life today. Fear not. Believe only. And you would see the glory of God. Praise God. We are talking about the wisdom of the, uh, the word of God or the wisdom of God's word. How does God think? How right are his thoughts? David said, I consider your thought concerning all things to be right. And I've shown every evil way. He considered God's thoughts and like, look, you know what? God is right about everything. God is right about all these things. Because sometimes people read the Bible and they get confused and say, but I don't understand. Why, why would God do this? Or why, why would this thing happen to so and so people? Just like yesterday, I was talking about the apostles of old. The, the, the apostles that walked directly with Jesus how most of them died some really you would call it gruesome deaths because those are not deaths in any way that um, will glorify god no that it's it doesn't glorify god in any way be honest be honest in your thoughts does that glorify god in any way say no you know sometimes you say if you know the the blood that was shed for the gospel to come to us now, when we say such things, do we really think about it? Are we trying to say that the blood of Jesus was not enough sacrifice to God for the gospel to get to all parts of the world? Does, does God require more shedding of blood so that the gospel will get to different places? Jesus made clear statements concerning those who believe in him. I come in here. Jesus said, because I live, you will live. You know, Jesus made, he, he, John chapter 17, he says, God has given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as receive him or as believed on him or as the Father has given him. And then he says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus said, John later echoed it, that anyone who has the Son has life. Jesus said in John chapter 6, Except a man eat of his flesh and drink his blood, he has no life in him. Anyone who eats his flesh and drink his blood have life. He went on to say, anyone, he said, not as your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. Anyone who eats my flesh will live forever. Now, hmm. Maybe it's talking about living forever spiritually, not just physically. But he compared it with people who ate manna in the wilderness. And he said, they are dead. What death did they die? 
physical or spiritual death? Oh, spiritual death, not physical death. Okay, were they all bad in the wilderness? Were they all bad? Are you following thoughts now? Were they all bad? So if he's talking about physical death, let's say, okay, it's not spiritual death because some were good, so they can't all die. Spiritual death. Okay, so they are all. Okay, maybe physical death. Okay, if he's talking about physical death, then he now says, anyone who eats my flesh will live. So which life is he talking about? Physical life or spiritual life? And understanding that the physical life is born from the spiritual one. Okay, so what death was he talking about? What life was he talking about when he says they shall live forever? Now you look at those things and, and, and even Jesus in the book of Luke, Luke shared that Jesus actually mentioned that yeah, Jesus told us that terrible things will happen, terrible times will come. But he gave us those instructions like mind yourself because these are the things that they are going to do to you. Meaning in itself, those things are preventive. Because if someone says, take heed to yourself, he's telling you, look, when you walk amongst, this, amongst these people, these are their thoughts, these are their plan. So take heed. So there is a way you can maneuver yourself through. So it's easy for someone to say, no, they all had to die like that so that the gospel will spread. Then the question comes in, what about John? Now you see, watching closely you will understand something even among because the disciples were men just like we have today all men don't understand things the same way that's the truth and number two every man has his own passion every man has the things that he wants to focus on now we were all called to focus on jesus but you see just like what i'm sharing with you today that focus on jesus has a lot to do with the kind of heart that you have. What do you want from Jesus? If, you, if I gather 10 people now and say, what do you want Jesus to do for you? You'll be amazed at the 10 of them, their answers might be even 10 different things. You'll be amazed, somebody will say, oh, you should just help me get a job. That's all I need from him. Another one will say, oh, if you just heal me of this sickness that I have. That's all. If you can do that for me, ah, I will serve him for the rest of my life. Another will say, oh, if you can just help me heal my marriage, if you can just help me give me children, if you can just... Now, you will be amazed everybody is just looking for. So Jesus himself asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they began to say, some say you're Elijah, some say you're, you're even John the Baptist, imagine. <laughs> Praise God. And one of the prophets... And Jesus said to them, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and gave a definition that's our Jesus. He says, this is who you are. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. He didn't describe Jesus as to his needs. He didn't describe Jesus. Now, remember all these people were, were ruled by colonial masters. They were, being, they were not having the best of times in terms of leadership in their, in their nation. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, there were all these thoughts in their mind about Jesus. Now, that's one of the problems Jesus had. Because there was an expectation, good or bad, there was an expectation that he is going to stop these foreign rulers. He is going to take over the nation of Israel from the Roman government and establish a new kingdom. So there was that expectation from ordinary people. But then the elders of the Jews were afraid that he was going to do the same thing. Why? Now, it's, it's natural because these are human beings. These men are, have already been given a pl places of privilege. 
they were elders so they were respected the governor respects them so they were good they they they, they are the ones caesar goes through to reach the people so i mean we, we are cool anything that is going to change this arrangement we don't want it so they have this thought in their mind that Jesus might be up to that. Jesus might come and start a revolt. And when that happens, we are going to be in trouble because we are supposed to maintain the peace. That's the role Caesar is expecting us to play in this nation. We are supposed to maintain the peace. If there's an uproar in terms of people rising to take over the government, Caesar, and if it fails, Caesar is going to hold us responsible. We may lose our lives. So you can see these guys were, from a selfish standpoint, opposing their expectation of Jesus. And the ordinary Jews who were closely with Jesus, even his disciples, you remember when the mother of John, James and John came to Jesus and said, please, I want to ask of a favor. Because, I mean, in their minds, he's the king. So one day he's going to rule over Israel. That's their thoughts, that's what they were thinking. She said, I want to make a request. So what is it? When, when you sit on your throne to rule, can my two sons, James and John, one sit on your right hand and the other sit on the left hand? Can they be your closest ministers? Can they be your closest? You know what I'm talking about? Now that's what she was insinuating. Now, that's to tell you that they had this expectation from the common Jews that Jesus might do this. And you remember in Acts chapter 1, the disciples had to ask Jesus, okay, now you've risen, you, you, you're saying you're going, you're saying in that day, in that day, okay, wait, can we ask you a question? What is it? Would you at this time hand over the kingdom? Let me read it for you. Ask. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want you to see how the thoughts in your mind can be cloud your judgment. Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. Because Jesus was telling them that, look, uh, you know, let's, let's read from verse 4. Yeah, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Okay. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, who were these folks? These were close disciples of Jesus not someone from the crowd shouting and speaking up these were those who had followed Jesus closely so they had this expectation and and that's you know sometimes people follow you you don't know why they are following you yes amazingly these guys have gone out with power given to them by Jesus to heal the sick cast out devils and do many great things now Jesus is living and he said, look, I'm sending you a power, the, the Holy Ghost. He will empower you. Now they now ask, they now say, he said, so don't go anywhere. Wait for the Holy Ghost to come. Okay. So when the Holy Ghost come, is that when you are going to what? Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Is that when you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So they have these thoughts in their mind. And look at the response Jesus gave. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father had put in his own power. What time and season is that? That Israel will be restored to the Jews. So Jesus broke their, busted their bubble right there. It's not for you to know the time or season the Lord has put in his own power. But something is going to happen to you. But we shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Their instructions were clear. Don't bother yourself about knowing when God is going to restore the nation of Israel to you. But rather be focused on what the Holy Spirit is going to be doing in you. And he said that what the Holy Spirit is going to be doing is to make you a witness unto me from here to the uttermost part 
of the world. Hearing this, could it just be? I said, could it just be? Because this is something we need to research on. That they still have this thing in their mind. And at some point, began to mix it up with their message. And that in itself has the potential of creating a society that is not thinking straight. Now, if they had this in their mind that, look, when the Holy Ghost comes, we are going to use that power to take over rulership. If that is a mentality in their hearts, do you know, in, in truth, even if they don't gather people to revolt against the government, their communication of their message may have such suggestions laced with it. And all the devil needs to do with that is to gaslight some ignorant people and stir up strife amongst the people. And the people, the true ministers are misunderstood. And there is this notion of these people are trying to raise an army of people that will revolt against the rulership existing in the nation. I hope you're getting what I'm saying to you. You think it's small, but if you don't understand what God is saying for what it is, not what God is saying that you are trying to interpret for him. You get to that point where your life becomes, um, you, 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 you get into a quagmire of, of, of issues. And then you try to drive a narrative that does not exist and eventually gets you into trouble. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Clear your heart. Your heart is your processing point of every prophecy, every word, every instruction. The word of God is not the problem. Your heart is the problem. If you have malice against someone else, and God comes and says, I'm going to bless you. Guess what you'll begin to think? Finally, this man is going to look at me and know that child. God, 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 God have elevated me above him. God just simply said, I'm going to bless you. But look at the thoughts in your heart. I'm going to be bigger than this person. And when I'm bigger than him, I'm going to show him all the things he's done to me. You see, because there was envy, because there was malice, in your heart towards someone else. And these things are subtle. So one is praying, oh Lord, my time of change has come. And all he's thinking about is all those people that have laughed at him. How he's going to show to them that, look, you guys, you're now small, I'm now big. Then you miss the context and the real ingredient of what God is saying to you. Because now it will begin to affect the direction that you obey from the Lord. God says, I'm going to bless you. And you're thinking, ah, so all these people have laughed at me. And then the next instruction God says is, I want to take you far away from this, your neighborhood. And then you begin to struggle with, ah, no, if I leave, it will look like uh, they defeated me. No, I want to stay here and show them that my God is alive. So now you begin to struggle with the instruction of God to leave. Meanwhile, God actually never planned for you to be where you are right now. You see how this affects your mind? My time is up. Praise God. We're going to continue from here tomorrow. I bless you today. And I decree in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that is blocking your view of the personality of God in your life. 
it is being wiped away right now. And let your eyes be open to see who God really is. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.